So, hey, here we are with episode two of building a Seaforth kilt step by step. Now, remember when I saw you last, I had figured everything out and made my chalk marks on the kilt. And then I stepped away from it and went and did something else. And, went, and then just, you know, so I could come back and look at it again and make my calculations a second time to make sure that I was absolutely right. And in that case, in that instant instance, we're careful to avoid confirmational bias. So I don't take the sheet that I've already worked everything out on. I put it to one side and I, and I do all my measurements again from first principles. And then I compare the two. And if they're, if they're the same, great, spot on. If they're different, I want to look into that. So I had done that. So I put it aside. I came back to it today, did it all through, found that I was, that my number still matched. And now and then I reduced it to height, you know, I ripped the top off. And this is something I didn't mention yesterday, and I can't remember if I mentioned it before. But when you're dealing with single width cloth, there's a good side and a less good side, or good edge, I should say. And they, they look a little bit different. And if you look carefully on the from the top of the kilt, you can see it's a bit wobbly, and there's occasional loop sticking out. This is not the finished edge. The finished edge is a bit straighter. I mean, there are wobbles in it because it's an organic fabric and, and things move, but you want to make sure that you're, you've chosen the right edge to be the bottom of your kilt. A lot of people make that mistake. Very few people, I hope, make it twice. I think I've made it once. So in any case, so I've reduced it to height, and now what I'm doing is <coughs> I'm basting in my box pleats. Now, if you remember, 39 pleats, 37 of, the, 37, ugh, 37 of them are going to be box pleats, and the, the first and the last is a knife pleat, like so. And this is the look that we're going for, because this is the old standard of very narrow pleats, very tight together. And what we see these days in more modern contrast contracts is they're saving a bit of effort by having fewer and wider pleats and it just doesn't look the same so by holding this holding myself to a higher standard i'm sort of making a rude gesture at those people that are compromising and i'm also paying sort of homage to the past as it were now my method for sewing it for creating box pleats isn't like anybody else's and it's because i had to teach myself the fellow who, with whom I first apprenticed never got around to teaching me. There could be a couple of reasons for that. A, he died not too long into my, what I'm calling an apprenticeship. And maybe he didn't think I was ready for it. Maybe he just didn't want to do box pleats anymore because they are finicky. So that plus the fact that I'm left-handed, I had to come up with my own methods. And the way I do it is what we see here. I based... As you see, I'm, I'm basting the, the uh, what I'm going to call it, the, the first crease, the one that's facing towards the front of the kilt. And I'm going to do this 37 times. I'm going to do all of these bastes. Then I'm going to press them, let them dry, and then come back and start sewing it up into the kilt. So it's time consuming. If anybody out there knows a better way to do it, tell us and we'll all be better for it. Um, this way... <clears throat> has a ridiculous amount of labor, but it gets the job done, right? And the reason why I do it this way, pressing it twice, is it gives me a proper sharp crease on this first crease. Because if I make the whole pleat up and press it, it's going to be cushioned by the, these extra layers of cloth, and it's not going to be such, it's not going to be as, as sharp a crease. So here is how I go about it. I have a needle and plain cotton white cotton thread. And as you can see up here, I have a huge spool of this stuff. I'm about a third of the way through it. There's several kilometers there, seriously. So I have a needle and thread. Now, I don't wax the thread. I don't knot the thread. I have my two gauges. Now, remember it's nine sixteenths and nine at the waist and nine sixteenths plus at the hip. And again, my, my gauges are all in two and a half inches long. So I put it in position to the top of the kilt. I line it up on that white line. Nice sharp chalk. I make that. 
I'm marking where the center of the tongue will be. Now I know that the bottom of my fell is there. I put the second gauge on. I mark it again. I could, okay, that's a little off because I was talking. That always happens, very frequently happens. Right, I could do it all the way along if I wish, but I believe that I'm good enough that I don't need to. So what I do, because remember, the pleat is parallel from the top of the kilt to the center of the buckle's tongue, and then it's tapered down to the bottom of the fell, and then it's parallel to the bottom. So what I'm doing is I pinch the cloth and I bring it over. Now how far to bring it over? Well, I bring it over so that the under the fold underneath is no more than the edge of the white line there and hopefully a little bit back. So I'm using my thumb. You can't see it, but you can see where my thumb is pushing against the, the hidden fold underneath. Right? So I'm going to hold that down with my finger. I stretch it flat and hold it down with my fingers and now I start basting. So I do a back stitch. And I'm holding it in position, back stitch, back stitch, sorry, running stitch, second back stitch. Yeah, I misspoke there. A back stitch there, running, and then a back stitch. And the reason why I did a back stitch there is I need that to hold by itself for a minute because now I'm going down to the bottom of the fell. I'm pinching it and pulling it across. And the same thing, I want the, under, the fold underneath, which we see right here, right, is no further in than the white line. The reason why being, when we sew this up later, if that cloth, the fold is way over here, it's going to get in the way and it's, it's not going to produce such a clean appearance. So, so I fold it, I check with my finger, thumb to see, okay, thumbnail, it's in the right position. Okay, so I put my little finger there. I stretch this tight, and this takes a little muscle power. I stretch this tight, and now I'm laying my fingers down to hold that in a straight line, rather like a violinist when you're, when you're learning how to get a difficult position. Um, and now running stitches again. Now that saves a bit of time rather than striking a line with it with a chalk, which I don't, which might be necessary in some cases. And by all means, if that's what you need to do for heaven's sake, go do it. Right? This isn't a contest. Well, it is when it gets to the, the quality of the finished work. But how you get there, if you find your own methods, good on you, right? And uh, and if you find a good method, share it. So so now there's remember what I'd said earlier about up here. It's folded so that we can't see the chalk line. Well, down here it's folded so we can see both chalk lines. And now that I've established that, I can pretty much do the rest by eye. Okay. Folding it and holding it and racing along. That's, that's possibly the gap between those two stitches was maybe a little bit far, but we'll find out. I may have to go back and do it again. Yeah, it should be about an inch or so, which to you metric people is about the width of your thumb. Okay, and I keep going down to the end, kind of running off. I should have pointed out here, I'm using a, a quilting board, or, which is basically some interesting sort of plastic, which has rather high friction. It doesn't, doesn't slide around very easily. It's a nice color, which green, which is good on the eyes. The white just sort of pulls your eyes out of your head. You know, I was using that other white uh, board. And it means that I'm not pecking holes in my table with my uh, with my needle. Okay, almost there. Of course, the needle takes that moment while well, I'm talking about it to dig into the cloth. <sighs> okay, sorry. The... This never happens when the camera isn't running, honest. <laughs> Or when I'm talking to somebody. Okay, almost there. A couple of stitches more. And a back stitch. Maybe a second back stitch because we want it to stay. So there we are. There's another pleat. And I'm just going to keep doing that right to the, the last pleat. Again, 39 pleats, 37 of which are box. 
So I'm going to just motor away on this. And this is a painstaking, tedious, boring task. But in, if you got your head in the right place, you got some music playing, or if you got something interesting to occupy your thoughts, you can, it, it can be quite pleasurable. There's a, a certain pleasant monotony, perhaps. It might be the way to describe it. But again, there's the way that works for me. So I'm going to leave you now. I'm going to carry on with this. You don't need to see me pressing this. When we next tune in, I'll be starting to sew the fell. So thank you. Stay safe. Be nice to each other.